Happy Monday morning. Jeremy Warner here in Kansas City on my Midwest tour down from Iowa after the Illinois game. But it's Monday and through the power of Zoom technology, we can still chat with our All-American linebacker, Line Enquirer football analyst, Jay Lehman, who will be on the call for Northwestern uh, this weekend in Illinois' regular season finale. Jay, Illinois can't be playing for bowl clinching eligibility here uh, after a loss to Iowa. Um, 33-23, the score looks a lot different than the game was with, I think it was 17 points in the last two minutes of this one. But a defensive struggle, I think, as we uh, expected. Um, But for Illinois, if we want to focus on a positive here right away, Jay, uh, Illinois went to Iowa City and had a chance to win in the fourth quarter. So I, I just think it just says another thing about Illinois has been very, very competitive in year one of Brett Bielma. Just overall thoughts there. Well, I think we go back to the 2018 game, which I had the the great fortune of calling that game. And that was a 63 nothing just beat down at Memorial Stadium uh, against, I think that was Lovey Smith's third year. And I believe it was last year in which Illinois started strong in the first quarter and then pretty much got it handed to him the last three quarters. And, and I think Josh Whitman had had mentioned that after the Iowa game, he really made the decision in his mind that he was probably going to have to move on to a different coach, right? Um, and Iowa is a program that we aspire to be like, uh, at least over the last 20 years. And uh, obviously they're a rival because they come in and get a lot of our in-state recruits. But, uh, you know, for Illinois to go on the road to Kinnick, be in that game without their head coach, they did some good things. They did some things, obviously, that um, we wish wouldn't have happened. But, but for the most part, uh, it, it shows strides. I don't think anybody can say that this team has not improved from a year ago based on where they're at now. Uh, you know, I, I know that two years ago they had six wins, right? I understand that. But I still think where we're at and how we're competitive within our own division speaks a lot. Very Iowa game, right, Jay? A special teams return touchdown. Uh, by Charlie Jones, you mentioned him last week as a guy to look out for. Uh, and he reminds me of Jakeem Grant that he takes every return. Like he's going to take every right. opportunity he can. Uh, but also two picks, right? Brandon Peters doesn't throw a lot of picks. Had two in this game, including Jack Hamill's return touchdown that kind of really was the backbreaker for Illinois. That's how they win games and, and they find a way to do it consistently. Right. I mean, the, usually it's their defense setting up their offense. I mean, really, they only had one true score touchdown wise against uh, Ryan Walters defense. Um, you know, I, I thought you when you look at the Iowa team, the things that we take for granted and forget about special teams, right? Because McCourt has been so solid. I think 33 out of 38 kickoffs have been in the end zone, right? I mean, I remember one time even kicked a you know, from the 20, he kicked it uh, in, in the end zone, right? After a, after like a personal foul or an unsportsmanlike after a touchdown. So we've been so solid, but, our, but you know, what happens is your coverage units aren't really tested that much. And you really can't, it's very difficult to practice a live kickoff or punt in a practice setting. Uh, one, it's just a lot of moving pieces. Two, you can get people hurt. So a lot of guys don't do it, right? I mean, I would think about my, my time on special teams in, in, in Illinois and in, in the NFL. I mean, I think I got more injuries on special teams in about a tenth of the plays as I did in anything, right? I mean, just because you're just going full speed and it's, it's not for the faint of heart in the Big Ten. And so uh, it's those little things. It's the turnovers we thought would have to be even with them in the turnover category. We ended up uh, being minus one. You know, Kirby Joseph got that pick. But you, you, you can't lose special teams and not be even in the turnover battle and beat Iowa. That, that's just not going to happen, uh, no matter how good or bad your offense or defense plays. Jay, I want to mention this. Um, Illinois had only, you mentioned they haven't had much practice on kickoffs. They've had five returns against them before this game. Illinois has only returned three. Uh, are, are we going to see the kickoff out of college football at some point? Because the rules basically are discouraging it. Because as you said, trying to take down injuries. Yeah, well, that's the rule. That's the rule they wanted. They wanted to put that rule in there to get rid of the injuries. Um, you know, I remember when we played, I, I was, and this makes me sound old, but there used to be something called the middle wedge where, I mean, it was four blockers, four offensive linemen or two tackles and two, two tight ends would come together. And all Purdue ran was the middle wedge. And I, I remember in 2004, 
uh, being a wedge buster, uh, they call you an R5 or an L5. That means you're fifth from the sideline and you're right next to the kicker. And th those were wedge busters. And your whole job was not to make the tackle, was to take two guys. And, uh, you know, I can honestly say I didn't know what was going on at this time. But every time I came out of the field, I was like, man, the field just looks different right now. Why does the field look different? And now we know those are concussions. You know, I, I'm not joking about it. I'm just saying that was how it was. And that was our job. And so kickoff has changed a lot, right? And uh, even if you try to sky kick it, they took it one other where you can fair catch it and get the ball at the 25, right? Where, you know, just the rule alone of changing it to a touchback, moving the ball up to the 35, and then changing it to a touchback goes to the 25. That was enough. They tried to gain the gamesmanship and what they call mortar kick or sky kick it. So, yeah, they've tried to take that out of the game. Yeah. Uh, Jay, defensively, only allowed 19 points to the number 17 team in the country. Uh, Ryan Walters' crew continues to give Illinois a chance. Uh, they did miss one guy, though. Ryder Perry did not travel with the team. We were not told the reasons why. Um, but they struggled on, on the interior without him. And Calvin Avery, I think there's probably a rep limit for, for what he can do. The Virtus Brown showed some flashes there late in the game, but I think we found out the the value of Rod Perry and and how tough it is going to be to replace him next year. Yeah. Well, so one, I think Rod Perry is either a fifth or sixth year senior at this point, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so he's a veteran uh, defensive lineman. Uh, so you can't replace experience. He's he's certainly not the biggest nose you would have. He, he does have a little wiggle to him though, which is great. Um, I think it shows, you know how strong we've gotten at the five technique, which is Johnny Newton and um, Keith Randolph and, and our edge players have improved. I mean, I think Carney and Gay have really improved throughout the year, um, but you, your nose, it's, it's kind of, your nose is a nose tackle is one of the most unsung heroes on your defense, right? Because they spend all kinds of time trying to keep linebackers free and maybe they, they have the hardest pass rush angle of anybody. There is no angle, right? So you're just head up on guys. And I think what we saw is we saw a lot of nose tackles, just what we call on skates. I mean, I saw nose tackles getting pushed five, six, seven, eight yards down the field. And, and when the middle of your defense has, is punctured like that, your linebackers aren't really able to get a good read. And then you have people coming off on Randolph and Newton, making them so it's hard, hard to have them make a play. It doesn't really affect Carney and Gay. So you saw some production on them, right? But it was very difficult. And I think we talk about recruiting needs. Most times we focus on quarterback and receivers and maybe replacing the offensive line. We, we still think, I still think we need a big wide bodied uh, nose tackle. Right. And um, I don't know if you go to the Juco route for that or whatnot, but if you look at these three, four defenses, um, they're going to have a wide body nose tackle in their base set. Now, what you saw Ryan Walters do later is he just went to the four down lineman set uh, where he just had Newton, and Keith Randolph in there, along with Carney and Gay. He didn't want to do that. I just think that was his best chance, I think, to actually stop what Iowa was doing. You brought up, uh, I mean, Isaiah Gay. What, what, a, what a performance, five and a half tackles for loss in that one. And, and he and Owen Carney uh, both played extremely well. I think Illinois fifth in the, the Big Ten now in sacks. But uh, what, what did you see out of – what have you seen out of those two uh, here, especially during late in the season here, Jay? Well, you know, I think it just it, it it shows that we are a developmental program, number one, right? None of the, those guys were not ready to play when they first got here, despite Isaiah Gay having a sack or two his first game. He just he just really wasn't ready to play on the line of scrimmage in the Big Ten. Uh, but I think it shows that with proper coaching and putting those guys in the in the best you know position for them to actually succeed, they can be more than serviceable. I mean, they have uh, lots of production, five and a half tackles for loss in a sack. That's a season for some guys, right? And, um, you know, Isaiah's made the plays when they call him, and, he, and he's flashed sometimes. Owen has been really strong at the point of attack. I think if you look at an NFL player outside linebacker, he's, he, he could be drafted by, uh, you know, a team like Pittsburgh or a team that really likes to run the 3-4. Um, I don't know if he'll start right away, but I think he's turned himself into a draftable player. I think Isaiah... Uh, has to still he's always been light in the loafers but it's been cool to see them and and used it their, the, to the best of their ability it also helps that they're either lined up to johnny newton or keith randolph right i mean that that really helps their production 
Jay, I want to ask you, this is like the week we have to vote for all Big Ten honors, both coaches uh, and media. And I mean, Illinois' defense has to get a few guys, at least sure. honorable mention, right? Kirby Joseph would almost seem the most likely with five picks now, three fumble recoveries, both lead the Big Ten. Sure. He's tied for the lead uh, in, in the country in interception. Sure. Who do you think deserves that on the defense? Because you're mentioning Randolph. I think he's another guy that, that probably sure. could and might not get it because uh, he doesn't have the the numbers that are sexy. So I think I think first team Kirby Joseph. I think he should be a first. I think he should be a first team All Big Ten player. Um, he's played all the games, so he's been productive. And uh, there's something to be said about just showing up every game. I mean, just making it through a season, right? And I know we say it's maybe not that serious. You know, I, I think. Keith might not have the flashy numbers that you want uh, for maybe being an all conference member. And he did miss two or three games. Certainly his numbers would be better. We don't even know how healthy Keith was in the month of October. I, I think he's gotten much healthier as the season progressed later on. And hence we've played better defensively. Um, I think, I think both Keith and Johnny are honorable mention guys. I think Owen Carney will be a second team guy. I really do. I, I think what he's been able to do, has been impressive. Um, corners tricky because a lot of good corners don't get a lot of traffic at them, right? I mean, Jalen Ramsey is probably the best corner in the NFL. And a lot of times his targets are really low, right? I mean, you throw away from a guy. And, and sometimes I think that happens with Devin Witherspoon. I, I really do. I think they pick on other guys than Witherspoon. I don't think Witherspoon, uh, and he missed some games too, um, will be all Big Ten this year. I think he'll be honorable mention. I think he's an all Big Ten in the future. The one guy that I think could also be a second or third team is Sidney Brown. Yeah. So uh, so th that's kind of the way I see it. Uh, that's not to take apart from, from a guy like Rod Perry, who we haven't talked to a ton a lot, but obviously we know is very, very, very important. Um, I don't think Barnes and Tolson at this point have enough to make headway with, with Hanson playing uh, half the year. Um, but I, I do think we have a chance to have three or four guys on the first team next year. All right, Jay, let's talk a little bit about the offensive side of the ball, which at this point is, is kind of consistent um, in, in that they struggle to score uh, more than 20 points. I know they ended up with 23 points, but uh, one of them really in garbage time there. Sure. Um, great start, right? I, it, if you want to give Tony Peterson credit, you know, I think you should uh, for this. It's They're getting off to quicker starts. What, what are you seeing – uh, early on in their scripts that th they're able to score these last two games sure. on their first drive? Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, I think looking at the Minnesota tape, we talked about the quick game was available early on. You know, I saw your tweet on that. Thanks for the props and the yeah. shout out on that. Love that. Nailed it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that, that, that was available. And, you know, they're able to, they were able to get guys like Donnie Navarro uh, on a backer, you know, um, and, and do a little, I call it a jig route. You act like you're going inside and then you go out, picked up a first down. Um, so I, I think one, what a quick game does for you is it negates the pass rush. The ball's out beforehand, right? So uh, Iowa traditionally in this year has, has a good pass rush. Uh, so number, number two, it gets your quarterback in a rhythm. And if you're a run, run, run first team, it can kind of throw off the defense on that first drive. Now, Phil Parker adjusted, right, as he would. But I was, I was happy to see one that they saw what Minnesota did and took note and were able to get a, a point out of it. Um, at the same time, uh, it, we, we're not able to sustain that, right? Like we, 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 for some reason, go in these, and some of it's quarterback related, I'm sure some of it's coaching, some of it's receiver. But, you know, after I think it was like six or seven, on, six of seven on the first drive, roughly. And then after that, I mean, he only had 13 receptions the whole year, game, 13 and 28, or what, what was he? Yeah, at one point, Jay, he was seven of his next 21. Um, so, yeah, that wasn't all Brandon, but some of it was, right? Yeah, and we got to catch the ball like, uh, you know, I know it's questionable. Luke Ford's got to catch that ball. I mean, got to hold on to it. Uh, Chase Brown had a couple bobbles. Hey, the first catch was great, but he had a couple bobbles, right? We, we've got to help him out. Um I think Casey Washington, who, you know, I, I feel like he was not able to make a contested catch early in his career, has really come on. And I give him a lot of credit. But even that ball to Casey Washington should have been a touchdown. Uh, that was underthrown quite a bit. Casey had, I think it was Riley Moss beat pretty bad. Um, 
Well, we've, we've just seen that a couple of times with Brandon. He likes to really hedge his bets, make sure people are open and whatnot. Um, and, and we weren't able to run the football. I, I, I kind of expected that with the way that Iowa likes to play. And so they were going to make Brandon Peters beat him. And there were some throws available. Sometimes they made him pay, sometimes not. Was the running game struggles, Jay, was that just more them stacking the box or was it uh, Illinois not playing well up front? You know, it's all relative on who you're playing against. Uh, I really think the Iowa D-line does a tremendous job of, of, stopping, of stopping the run. Um, so I think it's a combination of that. Um, I don't think uh, Pelcheski and Vidarian Lowe played their, their best games. Uh, and it's not uncommon not to play your best game against Iowa. So, I mean, they're, they're pretty solid. Um, we just, I think we're still a bit a ways away from being at the physicality level of an Iowa or Wisconsin uh, offensively. I think defensively we're getting there. Uh, we obviously had a weak spot in the middle of our defense with Rod Perry being out, but I, I do think we're getting there defensively offensively. We're not quite yet in certain games to impose our will Penn state. Yes. Minnesota. Yes. Right. But it, it, it doesn't seem to be consistent. We got out physical or I would say out quick against Rutgers. Um, and so, these are things that we just got to get more consistent on. I don't know though, because we're losing three of our best linemen, right? So hopefully we can make it better next year. Well, Jay, uh, the Illinois offense is, is one of the worst uh, in the big 10 statistically uh, knowing they're playing a different style and they can play a more conservative style with a better defense. Right. Um, it might not help Tony Peterson that Ryan Walters has, has made such big strides this year, but even Isaiah Williams said after the game, listen, the defense gave us so many opportunities. We got to help them. Like we, sure. we have to step up. Like obviously the defense has allowed Illinois to be competitive week in and week out, but Illinois has only won two of their last, what, seven big 10 games because the offense fails to get over 20 points. Most games. Sure. So what criticism is fair? I mean, obviously quarterback has to improve, but we've talked about Tony Peterson before. This is what Brett Bielema wants to run. Um, what, what do you think kind of criticism is fair of, of Tony Peterson, given that the offense hasn't shown much improvement, even as we go along through the season? Well, he's ju just opposed against, you know, a very good coordinator in Ryan Walters, right? Um, and, and, you know, historically over the last decade, we've had horrific defenses and below average offenses. If that's how I would, if that, if that's how I would characterize it. So we're used to being a little bit better on offense than we are on defense. And so um, 2018, remember how people felt about Rod Smith the same way they did about Ryan Walters, right? right. I mean, when we, and, and Rod Smith got paid, I think he got paid half a million then, you know, but we've had inflation. So uh, yeah, I mean, so Rod, Rod, well, Rod Smith was, you know, amazing, a miracle worker, big 10, led the big 10 in rushing, you know, the rich Rod offense. Um, so I, I think Ryan Walters is, is an elite coordinator and paid and paid so right. I mean, so to compare him to Tony Peterson, uh, I know they they have you know kind of sister and brother positions here at U of I. I don't know if that's necessarily fair. Number one, um, number two, I believe that Tony Peterson is running his offense, but he's heavily influenced by Brett Bielma. Brett Bielma wants to run this offense. He wants to do ball control. He wants to be physical at the point of attack. And um, I, I think Tony Peterson's a good coach. I don't think he has a fully loaded pistol sometimes, you know. Um, I think, meaning that Chase Brown's a really good player. I think, you know, McCray is a good player. Uh, I think Luke Ford and Daniel Barker are good players. They got some offensive linemen that are, that are good players, right? Uh, Casey Washington's improving, but one week, uh, this is week 12, I guess, but we, you know, cause it was by weeks and whatnot, but this is the, that was the 11th game of the season. And so we just haven't had much production on the quarterback situation. And I can tell you from firsthand knowledge of the big 10, if you got a defense and quarterback, you got a chance. If you don't have either, you have no chance. Right. And we got a defense. So it keeps us in games, but you look at Indiana, you know, ranked inside that I think they're number 17 to start the, you know, they've been to back-to-back -back January 1st bowl games, Gator Bowl and the Outback Bowl being in the Big Ten East had about 20 starters returning. I mean, had a lot of starters returning. 
they're going to go, they're not going to win a game in the Big Ten. They're probably going to lose to Purdue this week because they don't have a quarterback. They had other injuries, with it, but they don't have a quarterback at all. I mean, they have the reigning Big Ten receiver of the year in Ty Freifogel, and they can get him the ball. You know, they have Peyton Hendershot, probably a all Big Ten tight end. They can't get him the ball. So, it does, it, like, they're horrible because, you know, we look at Northwestern. Northwestern either wins the division or is near last in the division based on quarterback play. You know, they had, they had you know, Clayton Thorson in 2018. Hey, they, they crushed it. They, they had issues in 2019 with quarterback. Um, I believe Hunter Hunter as well. And that, and that, that one, uh, um, Hunter, what am I forgetting his name now? Johnson? Yeah. yeah, Hunter Johnson and TJ Green kind of played a little bit, I think. Um, but then, but then, you know, last year they get Peyton Ramsey and they win the division again. So, like, if you got a quarterback, you got a chance. I don't think any of the quarterbacks are great in the West. They all have moments. You know, Kyle throws for 500 against Michigan State, but he's got awesome receivers, right? You got Adrian Martinez, who can look awesome, but then makes a disastrous play with three minutes left to go. You got Tanner Morgan, who had exceptional numbers when he had two first round, uh, two top draft pick uh, players with Tyler Johnson and, and Rashad Bateman, right? Alex Padilla is average. I'm not sure how I would, I would trade him or Petrus for Peters. And that's saying something, right? So, I mean, there's not great quarterback play. If we could just be average, we'll be, would be right in the thick of things. Yeah. I think the Peyton Ramsey example is a great one. Um, you know, not, not a world beater. I don't think, you know, Northwestern fans, the, the small contingent that they are, were celebrating in the streets when that happened, but he just gave him stability and consistency. And, sure. and obviously that is, I think I, you know, I think there's there's people saying to fire Tony Peterson. I don't think that's happening. I, I don't know if that's fair to do that. Uh, Brett Bielma believes in the guy. He hired him first because for sure. a reason. Um, I, it, I think it's all going to come down to who, who's he land in the portal. Like that is the number one storyline of this offseason, right, Jay? I know there's many other needs they have to fill: offensive line, nose guard, corner. Right. But they need a, a stable cor- quarterback and it, it might not be the, the former five-star top 200 prospect in there, but just somebody who can come in and be 130 passer rating. Like think of how big of a difference that would make if you yeah. have that kind of efficiency out of the court. So, I mean, let me, so uh, a couple of things right there. Let me just say, I think Tony Peterson needs to say, stay. I like Tony Peterson. In fact, when we look at what is trending now, everybody wants to talk about spread. Everyone wants to talk about, RPO, all that stuff. What we're seeing a lot of outside zone and naked bootleg trending in the NFL and, and all that stuff. We, we see that happening, right? Number one. Number two is this. Uh, in, 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 you know, talking to coaches uh, across the country, it sounds like uh, we've heard of the great resignation, you know, in the economy. This is going to be called like the great cut coming to this, this, this year, right? Because everybody got a free year, right? And, and, and the way it works, just so you know, is in, in the traditional college setting is you, you play four years. And if you are a contributor, let's say you're in the two deep and play special teams or better, uh, you get your fifth year. Mm-hmm. If you're not doing that, usually coaches say, like, I'm not obligated to give you a fifth year. Hey, thanks for your thanks. For, let, let's move on. And usually it's pretty amicable, right? It's like, OK, you're, you're right. Like, we're moving on. I got my degree. I went to school for free. There's not hard feelings. Uh, th- this is different because really we have sophomores right now, eligibility wise, that have completed their four years. So coaches actually have the ability to go to them and say, we don't believe you're going to contribute. Uh, you've, you've had enough time to graduate. We're required to give you the four years. And so we're going to see the great cut and transfer of, of, of 2021, 2022. And um, a lot of it's going to come down to Number one, who do we think we can get? N- n- number two, what what are our needs? And I think this year, obviously, Brett Bielema didn't have a lot of time to hit transfer quarter or recruit. I think he was signed three days before early signing day last year. Um, it's not just a recruiting class. It's who can get, they get in the portal. We've seen what Michigan State's been able to do by hitting the portal in Mel Tucker's second year, right? Uh and we got big needs. We've said we don't think the quarterback position uh, uh, for this program that's going to build it to where it needs to be is on campus right now, at least from what we've seen. We don't get to see a lot of practice, right? So quarterback is number one. Uh, I'm putting nose tackle up there as, as number two because I don't know if we have a guy right now that, that's there. Um, offensive line, obviously playmakers on the edge. 
um, we might not get a lot of defensive transfers because we got a lot of defensive players coming back. Right. We're gonna, we have a chance to get a lot of offensive transfers. And, and really, from, from, in my mind, it's evaluating uh, mid major, a lot of mid-major talent. Like, I'm not sure we're going to get a lot of D1 transfers that come to Illinois, right? Because yeah, Jeff, I was going to ask you. Win. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I wanted yeah. to ask you because, like, it could be difficult. You're selling the worst passing offense in the Big Ten to quarterbacks sure. and wide receivers that you sure. like. I, I, offensive linemen, I think they can sell, right? I mean, Brett sure. Bielema and his history and this year sure. – Vidarian could be a draft pick. Um, but how would you sell that to a quarterback sure. or wide receiver? Yeah, so number one, I've heard Brett say this a lot. I mean, he probably has the most famous transfer portal quarterback in all history with Russell Wilson, right? Um, so he said, hey, you know, Russell Wilson has the same concerns. And we were at Wisconsin. He let he, I think he set the record for passing efficiency, and we were, you know, one play away from winning a national championship, Okay. So he can say that I, my thing, look at Roger Perry, who I think was South Carolina state or what, right. Yep. I mean, wh- I, there are lots of guys in FCS or uh, group of five teams that want to p- play major college football in the big 10 um, that are experienced that could help us get to the point where we can actually get really good power five transfers outside of a relationship. Cause I think we got Calvin Hart. And that was a relationship thing, right? I mean, uh, Eddie Smith, you know, whether he's going to play or not, we'll, we'll see. But that was a relationship thing with Ryan Walters. And so um, when I think about that, I'm like, I think we need to really evaluate mid-major, you know, guys that have started two or three years. I mean, there there was a tackle for um, uh, Indiana. I just did their game against Minnesota. Weston Kramer was from, you know, DeKalb, from Northern Illinois. You know, and he's played, started 12 games. And he's been a solid player. Jaden Reed, Michigan State, went to Western Michigan, right? Went to, went, went to Western Michigan, you know? And so they're, they're out there, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so sometimes I think that might be a bigger poll rather than we have to worry. I mean, we're kind of on the, we're, you know, we're kind of shark for that stuff. And then we're kind of the minnow when Notre Dame says, you know, we need a good back. Maybe we should talk to Chase Brown, you know? that, that, that That's what you worry about is uh, we don't want any of our – it is a two-way street. Right. All right, Jay, well, Illinois does have a chance to get to five wins. Uh, They would need a lot to break for them to make a bowl game at five wins. But, man, just to beat Northwestern. I mean, this is like two years ago where it's like, man, this is the year to beat them, and you weren't able to do it. Andrew Marty runs all over you offensively, didn't have your quarterback and top three receivers in that game. But you're pretty healthy going into this one. And Northwestern obviously is very vulnerable. What do do you think about this matchup? Because to end five and seven with – wins over Penn State, Minnesota, Northwestern. Uh, I think Brett Bielma, I think most of us on the outside would see that as, as a nice step forward uh, in year one for Brett Bielma. Well, we haven't beaten Northwestern since 2014, since, since, since Riley O'Toole was quarterback, okay? That's throwing it back there. Love Riley, was a leader and whatnot. Um, we have, I love you, Smith never beat him, Okay. Uh, they, they've pretty much become Chicago's big 10 team. Right. I mean, that's what, that's kind of their branding and whatnot. And they, they've, they've owned this series. There's no other way to put it. Even when they were bad uh, two years ago, Marty uh, and co owned us. So I think it's a couple things. Number one, I think this is a much bigger game than people give it credit for, for just winning the state. It, it is our rival, whether it's as hyped up as other rivals or not, it doesn't really matter. It is our rival, right? It's a trophy game. And I think it, it's it's more symbolic of, hey, there's a new sheriff in town for Illinois, and no longer is Northwestern going to just work over Illinois and be a guaranteed win. Because I think both in our minds for years, Northwestern and Illinois have looked at each other in the schedule and said, we can win that game, right? Now, usually Northwestern has won that game. And I just think it's huge. I think it's huge for recruiting. We've talked about, obviously, these last three games over and over, Minnesota, Iowa, Northwestern, get a lot of players that, um, you know, Illinois would like to have. So I think it's going to be huge. I think this is your bowl game. Um, I know some stuff could fall and you get a bowl game, but this has got to be classified as as your bowl game, especially if you're a senior, never beaten Northwestern. Um, You got a chance to do that. On paper, I think we should be favored. I mean, what are we favored by eight or something like that? I don't even know. 
Six and a half when I saw it. Yeah. Six and a half, right? So I just I think this is this is a much bigger game than people give it credit for, at least in the eyes of the team. What did it mean to you, Jay? Um, you know, I know you guys were had some big fish and you were you were going for big things when you were a senior, especially, but what did you think of Northwestern when you were an Illini player? Well, first off, you know, we never had great success against them. I, I mean, uh, the first four years we got beat. And even in 2006, we got beat. We should have probably beat them then. Uh, another three years, we, 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 we shouldn't have probably beat them. But um, the word I like to say is pesky. They're just always pesky. They always find a way. They're like, they're like how in the world do these people beat us, right? That's such, a, they're, they're, such a term of endearment too, isn't right, it? Right, right, right. They're, 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 they're pesky, but they're, they're well, listen, they're a well-coached football team. They've been well-coached for a long time, right? And, um, you know, although they might not have the greatest uh, four- and five-star recruits, although they're getting more of those, man, they rarely beat themselves, right? And and Illinois has a PhD in beating themselves, especially in these games, right? Uh, I do remember in 2007, uh, they, uh, they actually, uh, we were, we had just come off the Ohio State game and we, you know, there was this big talk of we we're going to have a letdown or whatnot. And I think we thought if we won that game, we would go to the Capital One Bowl. We, so it was important to us. And as seniors, we had never beat them. We had done a lot of things as a class to build that team and to turn the program around, never beat our rival. So to beat our rival on rivalry week was great. And uh, I remember back then, we, you just ran, you did like 12 games straight in the Big Ten. There was no bye week because you got done before Thanksgiving. You know, so it was actually the week before. So that was kind of an interesting scheduling thing they did because uh, supposedly Ohio State and Michigan wanted to be done before Thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. Now DeKalb gets the uh, I should say state championship games, which uh, three Illini commits uh, in that Jordan Hood, uh, Jordan Anderson, Malachi Hood, and then Ian Pugh of Fenwick as well. Well, Jay, hey, uh, great to see you on the call, man. We needed, uh, from what I hear, I didn't get to see it because uh, BTM Plus didn't have it, but I, I hear we need a little bit of an upgrade in the in the uh, broadcast. It's nice that you'll be in Champaign on the call for this game. Um, looking forward to it, man. I'm excited, guys. First game for Illinois this year that I get the call, and uh, I like to see Brett be on this team in person. Great stuff, Jay. We'll talk to you next week, man. Sure, man.